every building is a node in a larger system, right? Whether the urban system, how it connects to, you know, the suburban system to more rural systems. And when you look at city planning and building planning, I think the key thing we need to keep in mind is more of a holistic approach to the human experience and what type of societies are we creating. Welcome to The Future Of, a podcast by Fresh Consulting, where we discuss and learn about the future of different industries, markets, and technology verticals. Together, we'll chat with leaders and experts in the field and discuss how we can shape the future human experience. I'm your host, Jeff Dance. In this episode of The Future Of, we're joined by Jordan Sun, head of product, SoftBank Robotics Americas, and Chris Rohrbach, uh, vice president of Hughes Marino, to explore the future of the office building. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with me on this episode, uh, focused on the future around the office, the office building, and everything that comes with it. I'm excited to have two uh, experienced leaders um, and to talk about the future uh, together. Um, Jordan, if we can start with you, if you can just tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself uh, to kick off. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, it's a pleasure to join you and, uh, and join Chris on this podcast. Um, so a little bit about my background. I started out in finance, uh, originally my career uh, at an investment bank before spending several years at the intersection of the national security community and technology, uh, where I had the opportunity to both serve uh, as an army officer in uh, traditional infantry, uh, as well as special operations units, but also uh, spent time as a diplomat as well on the civilian side, uh, and then spent the remainder of my career in healthcare, uh, both in uh, med tech, uh, including surgical robotics, to also uh, digital health platforms as well. Uh, and then spent some time in venture uh, before the pandemic happened, where I then decided to join the city of San Jose and work for the mayor as the chief innovation officer for the city, um, uh, and then found my way to SoftBank very recently. Awesome. Excited to have you here with us. You know, for those that don't know, SoftBank is the largest investor in robotics worldwide and uh, invests a lot in the future. Uh, and they're thinking a lot about the future of the office building and, uh, you know, really about the future work and the robot human uh, interaction. So excited to have, I know you've kind of traveled the world Jordan had have had lots of different leadership experience um, in the workplace, in the boardroom, on the battlefield, right? Having done a few tours, uh, so excited to, to ask you for some more tips there, um, just from your personal experience as well. At the end, uh, if we can go over to you, to Chris, um, would you care to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, no, absolutely, Jeff. Thanks for having us, and excited to join Jordan and you in this conversation. Uh, so I've been in the commercial real estate space for about a decade now. And most recently, over the course of the last three or four years after joining Hughes Marino, solely focused on occupiers and tenants who either own or lease commercial real estate to run their business needs. Uh, before that, I spent a little bit of time in customer service and uh, retail sales at Nordstrom, coached some football along the way as well. And uh, when I'm not at work trying to help companies solve their office space needs, I, uh, a hus- I'm a husband and a father of three. Awesome. And an ultra marathoner. That's right. Yeah, no, excited to have you. I've been impressed with Hughes Marino f- and their, their focus on the human experience, um, not just as a broker, but really about how do you make workplaces work well and consider all that a human is and that we are. And so I, I'm excited to get your perspectives and also some thoughts there at the end about, you know, just mental toughness being a, being a ultra marathoner and how that plays into your busy life. Absolutely. So with that, let's dive in. Uh, as we think about the future of the office building, you know, we have the future of the building itself, right? We have the building exterior, we have the interior, we have the future of the office inside of the building and we have the work and, and the workplace. And then we just have the future of work. Um, all of these things are big topics, essentially. Um, and they're all kind of interrelated as we think about designing the future. So this episode is a little bit broader um, because it's it's interconnected to, to all of those pieces. Um, and it relates to the human experience, given that the city itself, you know, is the, in, the, in the buildings, the building is a node in the network uh, of a future smart city. Um, and we've seen through COVID how interconnected we are, right? Like, 
we're going to get COVID, whether we maybe we really, really like it or not, whether we close our borders or not, right? And uh, and so as we think about the interconnectivity of our lives and how we travel and how we work and how the the building is a central node to our workplace, really excited to dive in and uh, and to get some of your thoughts. I want to start with today and then kind of uh, move into the future and then at the end kind of get some of your just get some of your personal advice. So if we start with today, what are some of the problems um, we're seeing with uh, office buildings today? Chris, start with you. What are some of the the problems that, you know, innovation often comes from problems? Uh, so what are some of the things you're seeing in your uh, from your experience? Yeah, I think most of the problems that we're seeing and we're hearing from clients of ours and just groups that we're talking to obviously are surrounding the aspect of health and wellness, right? There were the companies that were always forward thinking when it came to their office space that you know, provided the additional amenities for their employees or sought out buildings that had these various aspects to them. And the reality is, though, most companies were not thinking about that. They were thinking about how many private offices, how many, you know, square feet per per employee, and that was about it. And if there were any additional considerations, a lot of those were more around energy efficiency. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with LEED, but LEED was kind of like the main player in terms of certifying buildings for being energy efficient. And what we're now starting to see is there's this kind of focus on wellness. So LEED has rolled out their own indoor air quality certification. There's other groups like WELL, which is the the International Well Building Institute that have their own certification. So a lot of the issues that we're seeing are stemming around this whole concept of just wellness and health and how does that interact with the employees. Thanks for those current insights. Jordan, what about you? What are some of the, the bigger problems, you know, especially being at the city level, working with other corporations, buildings being a node in that city? Uh, what are some of the problems that, that you see or have seen? Yeah, you know, it's it's a very interesting point when you look at pre and post COVID, right? And so for at least my time with the city of San Jose, you know, we had over, at least over 46 high uh, buildings uh, that were in the downtown area that were considered high rises. Um, And, you know, it was a stark contrast when you look at broader trends that happened pre and post COVID. Pre COVID, something like 90% of adults uh, spend most of their time indoors. And then, you know, fast forward, uh, that number dropped to like 46%. And so more people were spending time outdoors. Um, and I'm very curious as to whether or not those trends stay uh, when it comes to, you know, a shift to more outdoor environments, uh, to more openly vented spaces. Um, and then, but also thinking about, you know, to, to Chris's point, uh, establishing new standards of wellness. And then I think the other part is that really forced, at least when I was at the city, was really rethinking how we can meet our customers uh, where they are um, and be able to address some of the challenges to keep the economy going. So things like, uh, you know, a company like Camino uh, as a startup was was working on really cool technology, uh, automating uh, and digitizing and automating, permitting, licensing and inspections uh, was, was a huge opportunity uh, coming out of COVID. And I think uh, it probably still will be to some degree, because I think people expect a lot more now that so much of uh, some of local government and state government have digitized, but there's so much more work that can be done. Thank you. It's really interesting to think about how the pandemic is changing and will change the future of the office. And I think your point, it's like yet, yet to be determined. But Chris, from your perspective, how, how are you seeing it change now? Because you're out there helping people find space now and people are still renting buildings. They're still building buildings, right? And yet in many cities, uh, buildings are still fa- fairly empty. In other cities, you know, we see we see a massive uh, a trend, at least post Omicron, that, you know, the tr- companies truly are coming back. So tell us more about what you're seeing and uh, from from the, the pandemic, uh, you know, effects. Yeah, I think that the biggest thing that companies are now looking for is kind of this combination to Jordan's point of bringing the outside in, so to speak, and having some of these 
components that feel a little bit more like a park type setting in a downtown urban high-rise environment. Um, an example of that would be Skanska is one of the largest developers and landlords of office buildings in the world. And they have a project in downtown Bellevue going on right now called The Eight. And obviously, weather and climate plays into this role a little bit with being in Seattle and having the rain that we have here. But uh, the entire you know, two or three ground floors are this whole concept of a library and a lounge and inner mixing retail and almost, you know, creating an urban park-like setting with that wellness factor in place and the fresh air and the ability to, you know, take your meeting ad hoc in the cafe and things of that nature. So uh, I would say that most of the companies that are forward thinking and realize that the office is going to continue to play a large role in their organization moving forward, even if that is some sort of a hybrid model, they have to provide additional amenities to their employees to make it something where their employees want to be at as opposed to have to be at. Um, And I will say there's companies that have been doing this, like Valve is a company here locally, for example, that I would say kind of sets the gold standard for what they offer their employees when it comes to massage rooms in their office space and a barber shop and an entire half of a floor of a downtown high rise that has field turf and personal training studios. And they have executive chefs that cook meals and stuff like those are the things that I think you're going to have to start to see and expect from buildings and more specifically from inside your space in order to attract the talent and encourage people to want to come back into the office and you know, hopefully, get those benefits of the collaboration and productivity that we've that we've seen uh, can be enhanced by being together. And I think Jeff, to to add on to that point, you know, when we think about the experience for uh, occupants in the building, you know, th- th- it really depends on are you is it an office, is it a residential, um, is it retail, and but I think there's some consistent themes that I think we're highlighting there, which is at, at the very least the feeling of safety and cleanliness is, is definitely prioritized, right? So what was really interesting here for SoftBank, at least, is seeing some of our customers uh, respond incredibly positively, including their staff uh, with our cleaning robots and saying, look, you know, covering 99.9% of our areas and path- having pathogen removal out of our floors is, is a fantastic offering to say we have a commitment uh, to your safety and your experience. And I think the other part is, just you know, seeing how other people are responding on social media too to the idea of robots being able to do that heavy lift, um, whereas you know we don't have to send humans to do the same repetitive task over and over again, especially when it's probably unsafe to continuously expose people, you know. And and so I think there's just a lot of opportunity that goes uh, to be explored as we think about uh, improving. Uh, the, the experience overall indoors and eventually outdoors too. That's awesome. I, we heard from a, an outside expert that also does a lot of uh, space planning and um, workplace uh, design. Uh, his name was Morton Jorgensen, and he talked about emotion, how emotion is actually part motion, essentially. He talked about the importance of motion and movement my name is Morten Jorgensen. I am the CEO of Friday PM, and I've spent my whole career working with customers about workplace transformation and workplace strategy. And I'm massively passionate about how do we figure out the best way to work in the future. For some, that is connecting square meters to corporate strategy, but for others, it's also looking at it in a whole new perspective, which we do at Friday PM. So if we're looking at design and technology, that is actually the space that I operate in, in my daily life. I think there's two sides to this. One is we need to understand on a neurological level, almost down to an emotional level, how design impacts us when we work. We need to understand how colors affect our emotions, how smells affect our emotion. We need to understand what mode of light do I need to be in for different work types. As I talked about before, I need to have the right space for the right work mode. 
And that word mode needs to be designed to that specific situation I am in. I think we forget the importance of emotional states. I've said it to others in the past. I think most of us know how important emotions are during the day. We get happy, we get sad, we get frustrated. We go all over the spectrum during the day. But I think a big piece here is understanding what is emotion. And emotion in its word is emotion. It is energy in motion. And we can control that energy by understanding how design impacts us when we are in a physical state. And I think one of the things we we learned through the pandemic is that if we stay in one place for very long in that same position, it's actually not healthy. A lot of studies done about like, you know, getting up, moving about, like actually the commute was actually healthy for our brains, right? To like wind up, wind down, uh, maybe it depends on the commute, but you know, getting up, working for a little bit, going to the coffee shop, maybe, you know, uh, commuting into work, going to work, uh, going to a meeting, going to lunch. Uh, there's a lot of movement there and that actually plays into our emotion and well-being, the ability to kind of reset, right? And, and have, uh, but you know, it's, it's a balance, right? Where we want to connect, but we also need to disconnect. Um, and so, uh, I, seems like we really acce- accelerated our learning of what's healthy for humans and what's and how any extreme you know uh can can have unintended consequences um so going back to uh this new sort of hybrid workplace that we see a lot of companies adopting um how do we see that uh changing and impacting workplaces today again we're going to talk again even deeper about the future but what are we seeing companies do today to kind of encourage this new hybrid uh, model that seems like most companies are adopting? I, w- I would say that one of the biggest things that's coming into play here is recruiting and retention, right? Like as certain companies set the standard for what they're going to allow or for that matter, require from their employees, it's a trickle down effect with everybody. And so the employee is gaining more power than they've ever had before in kind of dictating when and where they do work. That said, you know, a couple of things that we're really trying to focus on at News Marino and encourage our impo- or our companies that we work with to take into consideration is not just a one size fits all, you know, we're a company that's hybrid and we work from the office two days a week and we work from home two days a week, but what individual employees or teams benefit the most from working in the office or from working from home. An example of that would be most salespeople probably thrive off the energy of other salespeople around them. They're making phone calls. They're digging up new business. I, I know that's how I operate in the you know space that I'm in. And a lot of what I do is sales, selling our product and selling our service that we can provide for our clients. But a heads down engineer who's coding all day probably doesn't need to be in the office as much and and doesn't benefit as much from that. And then the other thing that we're focusing on is as opposed to doing your hybrid model as, you know, alphabetical or whatever it is, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, trying to find at least one day a week or maybe one day every other week where you're bringing the entire team together. Because if you don't have that cross collaboration and you know, just from a culture standpoint and from a wellness standpoint of being able to see people that you were used to seeing that, you know, you might have a really good relationship with, but otherwise don't interact with outside of at lunch or the water cooler because they're on a different team than yours. There's a lot of value in that. And so it's really hard to grow and expand your culture virtually. And so bringing the entire team together, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, we found has been really important to, you know, grow and enhance that in this hybrid work environment. So really like the team makeup and then some of the personal makeup of like how you work, what you do, what your company does, what your division does could, could tie into your kind of hybrid work schedule. Um, as we think about the space itself, um, what, how, how are we seeing spaces change uh, to, to, you know, you mentioned some of the amenities of drawing people back. But what's actually changing uh, inside? Yeah, I would say that this this hybrid work environment is requiring companies to spread out a little bit more in their space over the last you know twenty years as technology has been advancing. You've seen 
just spaces get more and more dense over time. And this bench seating where people are just sitting right next to each other. And now you're having to kind of provide for more space per employee for not only wellness, but also to just encourage this, um, this kind of hybrid work, work environment. And from a health standpoint on kind of this hot desking, sorry, is what I was trying to say is this, this hot desking is kind of a hot topic right now. And I think it's here to stay for a while, but there certainly comes some health concerns with that. So what sort of technology solutions are there that can help with this? I was on the phone with a furniture vendor just recently, and they were talking about how they have these modular, you know, furniture systems that are all equipped with a UV basically drawer where at the end of the day, you put all your stuff in there and for 30 seconds, it sanitizes everything and you pull it out and you leave. And when you get there in the morning, you put all your stuff in there and it 30 seconds later, it's completely sanitized. So those are the sorts of things that um, have really started to change. And most of that can be accomplished through furniture solutions, uh, believe it or not, as, unless you were already just a really heavily built out private office type environment going into this whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the, the key things are really just kind of the work that you have to enable, right? Which is when, when we look at indoor spaces, you know, we, our company has shifted entirely into WeWork uh, spaces for the most part, and you know, pods are are, are definitely a necessary uh, good and evil to have in order to be able to conduct your meetings. I think the other part is giving employees, you know, thinking beyond just the spaces itself, giving them the technology package for them to be able to operate. Right. So thinking like noise canceling headphones as a standard um, beyond just giving a laptop um, is, I think, something that. A lot of folks are, are are thinking about in terms of you know what's the onboarding package from an IT perspective. Yeah, I mean it, it depends on the employee. At the end of the day, I, I do see a lot of younger employees crave. Like if you look at the the mangs of the world, at least here in SF, uh, the SF offices they're mostly younger, uh, younger demographic. You know, between the ages of you know twenty three to thirty five that are really coming into the office a lot more uh, than people who tend to have families. Let's shift to the, just kind of focus a little bit more on the future. Uh, appreciate all the insights so far on kind of the present day, some of the trends we're seeing, and we can't ignore how big the pandemic has been for accelerating so much shifts, shifts that could have taken 10 years to accomplish that, you know, were accelerated in, in a year or two. So, you know, some of the future we're seeing now because we accelerated it. Um, but so as we think forward, like, you know, 10 to 20 years from now, what are some of the things you guys see in the future? Yeah, I think the thing that I'm most excited about is um, how do we start crafting, to your earlier point, uh, you know, every building is a, is a node in a larger system, right? Whether the urban system, how it connects to, you know, the suburban system, um, uh, to, to, to more rural systems. And um, when you look at city planning and building planning, I think the key thing we need to keep in mind is more of a holistic approach to the human experience and what type of societies are we creating. And so the three things that come to mind for me as well, at least, is health. You know, and health and wellness goes beyond sterilization and emergency events, right? I'm thinking just encouraging people to have a healthier lifestyle, to Chris's point, to move and be active, uh, to be able to mix with other populations. Um, I think the second thing that comes to mind is accessibility to enable that you're building a city that is accessible for all, given um, the high amounts of disabilities that, you know, I think people don't expect Americans to have uh, as a percentage and of our population. And I think that will only increase uh, as our aging population gets older. Um, and then the third is equity, you know, and, and that's both economic, uh, that's social justice, that's um, education, uh, and really thinking about, uh, you know, what type of equitable outcomes are we creating by laying new rails of infrastructure, if you will, and new methods of transportation, such as micro mobility, uh, and, and looking at the patterns of movement and mixing of populations and, and the economic, socioeconomic development that happens because of that. Chris, what are some of your thoughts on, on the future? Um, help us help us see into that a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's a great um, question and thing to think about. One thing that I'd like to start by saying, though, is, you know, 10 to 15 years from an office building perspective is not a huge amount of time. And why I say that is there's companies like Amazon, 
Facebook, Microsoft that are doubling down on office space and they're building brand new buildings today. And the leases that they're signing in these buildings are 10 to 15 years. So outside of making some changes to the inside environment, maybe a few years into their tenancy, there's not going to be a ton of huge major changes from just the building itself perspective. That said, we're tracking and what I do think you will see is just a greater importance of touchless everything. And so what does that mean? You know, we've made the transition from the archaic elevators to the destination elevators, but now it needs to be that the elevator just automatically reads your card in your wallet when you walk near it and it knows what floor you're supposed to go to and calls the elevator and you don't ever have to touch or, or scan anything. Um, you know, technology that takes your temperature as you walk through the front door, things of that nature. And then something that I'm actually curious to get Jordan's thoughts on too, that I've been thinking about a lot recently is the disruption of autonomous vehicles and parking garages. So many of these office buildings have these massive parking garages built for the infrastructure of each employee having their own vehicle and driving to work every day. And there's this interesting you know, discussion being had about when we go to a mostly or completely autonomous uh, vehicle society, that no one will have their own car that will take them to work and just park there and sit there all day. It will go out and be doing things for you while you're at work. And so does the need for the parking garage completely disappear? And if so, what are some new um, you know, uses for that space? Does it become a, a last mile, you know, warehouse, low bay warehouse for the likes of the Amazons of the world? Does it become data centers as everything continues to go and stay in the cloud? And so I think when you look at the office building over the course of the next 10 to, to 15 years, certainly the way that people and humans interact with it, once they go in the front doors, will be different and will continue to accelerate through technology. But the, the the look and the feel of the office building, I mean, the buildings that are here today are going to be here in 10 or 15 years. And, and the same companies, for, for that matter, for the most part, are going to be occupying that space. So I know I kind of asked a question in the middle there to Jordan when I was making that comment about the autonomous, but those are some of my thoughts and curious to get your guys' insight into kind of that whole autonomous driving and, and uh, transportation and technology side of things. It's a really great point, Chris, that you made where, you know, the really the 10 to 20 is kind of more or less fixed in into the roadmap, if you will. Um, and so to your point on, on the autonomy side, look, you know, my my city, we had a very big autonomous vehicle pilot with Mercedes that then transformed into autonomous delivery systems, specifically uh, delivery robots um, during the pandemic uh, because of safety reasons. Um, and I think you're seeing broadly in the autonomy sector right now a struggle to achieve the L4 goals that everybody, the, the level four goals that everybody thought they would achieve. So to your point on the parking lots, you know, Shared or mobility on demand is one thing, and, and and I'm actually more interested, and you're seeing this already, just the monetization, the existing monetization of unused parking lots to garages by companies like Reef that have raised significant venture funding as well to do so. Um, but looking further is you know something that I was really passionate about in the city and pushing forward was electric vertical takeoff and landing, and other urban air mobility opportunities. And so when you think about really recreating the networks and not having to lay physical rails, you know, like railroads tracks um, to connect uh, entire regions. I think Evitol is going to have a huge disrupting factor. And guess what? These platforms need to land somewhere. And so the Vertiports, I think, is going to be a fantastic opportunity for some of these garages who have access to air qualified airspace. Um, so that's, you know, one example that I was really passionate about that we're pushing forward, but the planning of those vertiports, once again, you have to take into consideration that is an economic hub, that is a transportation hub. And there are factors in there when it comes to equity inclusion that we need to take into consideration. Um, but 50 years out, actually, if, if, if Jeff, you're okay with that, <laughs> I, I would love 50 years out, I would love to see all the stuff that we're seeing in material science that I see in the national security community and defense community when it comes to self-healing properties of materials, you know, things that are self-annealing, 
such as streets uh, to buildings to, um, you know, I mean, just new experiences with uh, obviously metaverses, it's, it's huge, you know, but think about mixed reality spaces. Um, and then I think the last part is biophilic environments where we have natural organic properties built into our buildings that are, you know, carbon positive in terms of the overall experience, but also impacts our mental well-being uh, by mixing, you know, nature back into highly inorganic structures that we've created over, you know, since we've modernized as a society. Let me comment on a few of these uh, these amazing insights because <laughs> it's awesome. Thinking about the parking garage, there's less cars. There's also autonomous cars in the future. How do we think about the parking garage uh, and all the different use cases that the parking garage could entail? Because that's a ton of space underneath buildings, right? Mine would have like a skate park and a bike park and, you know, the indoor ski park if I'm in Dubai, which I experienced a, a couple months ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then thinking about the top of the building, the the, the vertical landing pads, right, for the these elect, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, people think that's really futuristic. We think about the Jetsons, but the reality is there's billions of dollars. There's 20 companies working on that right now. Over 15 have, 1,500 have already been ordered by nine airlines. They're saying, we need to be in this space because we know it's huge in the future. So as we think about the buildings being, hey, if we're if you're going to get in one of these, like you need to go somewhere. So where you need a place to land, right? Uh, and what we've also seen through the pandemic is people moving farther away. So how do we increase some of the mobility? It seems like th this is a place that could really take off because of the dollars, because of the technology, and because of the pain that comes from commuting on the ground. Uh, obviously, a massive, complex thing that there are a lot of players at the macro level, at the micro level working on this. But as we think about the building being a, a, a landing pad, um, I think that's really exciting. And also thinking about underneath the building and thinking about all the parking uh, optionality uh, that could happen. I liked your point also about renewables. Um, and I think that seems to be an important trend. You know, these buildings are huge. They're, they're like many cities. They're, they have their, their full ecosystems inside. You know, Modern buildings often are mixed use. Um, have people living, have restaurants, have you know different businesses, um, and uh, thinking about the renewable aspect, the re and the renewable energy aspect of buildings. You know, uh, the building itself could the, the amount of water that a building can collect to serve its own needs with that much surface area, or the amount of energy that that building can can, can collect if it, if they had uh, solar uh, windows. Um, seeing a lot of uh, uh, posts about that. Um, that's really exciting to think about our buildings. They're such big poles of energy, right? And you think about just the human waste that comes out of a building in a single day. It's it's mind boggling. If you look at those metrics for New York as an example. Uh, but um, what other things are we seeing on that end? Chris, I'm curious um, if you have any insights into, to, into buildings being more renewable sources, any trends uh, related to that? Yeah, it's it's still something that's a little bit in its infancy. You know, these this this whole idea of kind of outside in and, and inside out that there are components to that where you're having more greenery and bringing more, you know, trees and different things like that into the ecosystem that otherwise was just a, you know, metal and glass shell over the course of the last 20 or 30 years. There's there's different architectural features to it that that top of the um you know buildings as opposed to just being an area for mechanical and electrical and different things like that are now being exposed and you are seeing either wind or solar panels um put up there as well as amenity spaces for employees to go outside at the top of the building and have a place to you know check out a little bit so it's it's still a little bit early on and we're not seeing it like on a massive scale where someone's come out and done like a building that has an entire um solar solar panel eco or exoskeleton, skeleton so to speak but um components of that are being built into most of the new kind of high-rise mid-rise buildings that are being built this year and um moving forward jordan i'm curious on your end um having traveled you know a lot around uh, asia and uh, around the world like what are some of the interesting your things you're seeing from a from a building design obviously you guys mentioned that, hey, a building, a lot of the buildings are here. They have long lives. Leases have been signed for 10 or 15 years. And so things are changing around those structures. But there's also a lot of 
new buildings being created um, at the same time as we think about the future. Uh, I, I was recently in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and saw a lot of interesting buildings. Building as, buildings as art, as an example, as we think about about our evolution, you know, and he, as humans, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you kind of, you always go towards art and creativity at the top, but buildings actually is art, you know, stack buildings, picture frame buildings, a building that looks like a sale, right? Lots of interesting things happening uh, in that space of the world where there's unlimited space and unlimited capital and, and un- inexpensive labor. I'm curious, um, having traveled around uh, Asia quite a bit, uh, Jordan, what are you seeing as far as things that are being created? Um, what innovative things have, have you seen? It's funny that you mentioned it. And as much as I want to say it's it's the design thing that I've seen or a technology thing that I've seen, I think the the thing that the idea that keeps coming to mind when you ask that question was the idea of who actually did the hard work to design the building and who did the hard work to build the building and what did they get out of it. And the people running the building, what did they get out of it? And I think what would be the most interesting thing that I'm seeing right now are the discussions around applying Web3 technologies, specifically thinking about decentralized autonomous organizations and thinking about recreating the economics for all the other people that need, that could benefit from the upside of these buildings. You know, and so when you think about a luxury condo being built, um, who are the people that benefit mostly? It's it's probably the investors, you know, the owners, and uh, and and the people who end up buying it and then sell it, you know, five to six years later for another big profit, right? It, but it, but what about the builder? What about the immigrant builder that that you know, or what about your door person? And I think there's just a lot of movement right now that I'm seeing where developers are also asking that tough question of like, Hey, how do I incentivize my people who are building this and the contracts that are building this to actually meet those deadlines in an appropriate manner and, and create sort of economic alignment? Um, you know, cause there's always a, a principal agency problem in every, in everything you do when you contract out. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity in the crypto space to be able to solve for some of those you, uh, economic alignments, uh, but actually to put, you know, the opportunity back into the very hands of people who have built it, versus only have you know the investors uh, and those who can afford to live there benefit from it, economically speaking. Yeah, no, the, the the very creation of the buildings and the economic aspect of buildings and the trend with decentralization, which we're seeing, you know, around the world in different ways. Uh, how does that affect buildings? Um, even the creation itself um, and the economics of that, uh, could, you could create some interesting alignment, especially for immigrant la- uh, laborers. Um, that could solve a lot of problems. And the other is architects, right? How many junior architects that work at these major architect firms, where it's the partners at the architect firms are the ones that really benefit, right? And everybody else with a PhD or a, you know, an architecture sort of licensing, you know, they're making like 70, 80, you know, with very, very well established engineering and, and, and architecture degrees, you know, from very well known schools. It's, it's shocking. I love this part of the conversation. And I think it brings up even a broader question of just how, where or where or how is the intersection between blockchain, cryptocurrency and real estate in general, right? So going back to even some of the initial uh, test cases in Cook County, Illinois, where they were trying to put all of the different parcel data onto the blockchain. And I even think about what I do on a day-to-day basis when I get a lease signed for a client. Most landlords are still requiring three hard copies, single-sided paper copies of a lease that are 100 plus pages long, where in my the back of my mind, I'm thinking there's a solution for this with blockchain not only from the start of the negotiations of the different lease terms, but then all the way through to the execution of it. But then to Jordan's point, you're you're already starting to see the ability to invest in smaller percentages of real estate or things of that nature because of cryptocurrency and blockchain. And then what Jordan's talking about is even taking it one step further and utilizing that technology to 
create more a more equal playing field for the contributions that various people had to to these larger projects. So it's something that's super fascinating. It doesn't necessarily directly uh, apply just to the office building, but I think just real estate in general and how technology specifically decentralization, blockchain and cryptocurrency can disrupt that and uh, for that matter, improve that process for pretty much everybody. And it's about creating alignment, right? Which is what is the goal of everybody working together here? It is to hit the deadline of, hey, at this point, you know, this building is ready for sale, right? And you see so many condos. And I think during the pandemic, it was very obvious how many condos went into significant delay, right? And having to restructure their capital, uh, however they financed uh, the, the deal to be able to get it done is, is, is fascinating. And so like, how do we create that alignment um, at, at all levels of the organization and those who contributed to this building going from ground to up? It's fascinating. Decentralization is a, a general theme. The building is very much a central, a centralized place, you know, for people to kind of come and connect in the node of, of this broader network of, of work. Right. Um, so I didn't know how decentralization played into the office building. So it's cool to hear your insights, um, about how it could play just in the very, you know, in the, in the creation or in the contracting, uh, aspect of, uh, of how things get done. I am a big believer that the world will be more decentralized and that we will, at some point, the pendulum will swing the other way from the urbanization that we see today. We see it already now. I see it in my network. People that have lived in, in London or in Copenhagen or in Shanghai or New York for a while, they start to readdress the way they live. They might move a little bit out of the city to go into the city for work, or some of them have bought vacation houses away from the city, so they spent Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday there. They're still working, but they have multiple locations. So the impact for the office building, I think, is twofold. I think it is we will, as human beings, kind of take a stand on the life that we're living today. And then on the other side, I think technology will have a massive influence on the way office buildings look today. One simple fact, today office buildings are leased per company. You might go to a co-working space, but the majority of office spaces are leased by companies. So that means one company, one floor, or one company, three floors. You are not in an office building where you are mixing Work, state, work points around the office. So why shouldn't marketing from company A and company C have the ability to sit together because they can actually learn from each other. They're not competing. It's not competitive uh, pump companies, but they have a massive possibility to collaborate in the office. So I think mixed use buildings will be a, a big piece. And I think we have fantastic real estate in the city that is only occupied by corporates. And I walked through London the other day at my travel here at nine in the evening, it's empty, it's deserted areas. And I feel so bad for this because it's not utilized in the right way. So I think mixed use will be a big piece for office buildings in the future as well. As we think about technology itself, you know, it seems to be kind of a force in of itself. It has a life of its own a little bit, right? It just keeps rolling. And, and sometimes humans are trying to catch up, right? Like we're kind of, we're trying to catch up with what's coming because there's economics to creating new technology. So as we think about, you know, uh, the future and um, the human experience, um, how can we be better designers of you know, the, the places that we work, you guys had mentioned, uh, a lot of topics so far, but as we think about technology itself, like Jordan, I'm interested in some of your thoughts because, you know, SoftBank is bringing a lot of robots to kind of support. And does that compete with the human experience? How do, how do humans and robots work together? Um, you know, these things are going to happen no matter what. And, and without knowing more or thinking about more, we can't kind of design with intent. Um, so interested in some of your thoughts on, on, on that. Yeah. And I think, you know, with physical robots, you know, and, and, and even with, you know, rob robotic automation, uh, when it comes to software, 
you know, I think the goal is always to augment and empower, right? And it's, I think that's a really important goal for us to have in mind as we think about, um, you know, going back to my days of when I was, you know, before I became an officer in, in the army, just, you know, looking at our vacuuming robots or, or uh, whether it was vacuuming, sweeping, or polishing floors um, in the barracks, I mean, it was you know terrible jobs to do, right? To to also cleaning the latrines, like no, you know, there's like the detail we call it details, like that's the detail nobody really wanted to do, but you had to get it done. Um, and so you would volunteer for it. Uh, there is just so much opportunity where you know when we look at what people actually do and and reflecting on the purpose and dignity of work that I think is quite interesting. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that trends happen. And I think at the same time, you meet that, you, you match that with, you know, the great resignation uh, data that you're seeing. Um, I, I think there's a really interesting shift to think about how can we rethink the, the traditional uh, tasks that are being done and also give people the opportunity and space to say, look, you know, maybe uh, I can put resources towards upskilling um, and, and enable you to, you know, go from cleaning toilets to being a robot operator. Um, and have these additional toolkits available. Um, and so I think there's a host of services that haven't even begun to, I think, fully emerge when we think about the robo-economy um, that needs to happen. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited for what happens in the next, you know, I would say even 10 years. Really like the notion of uh, augmenting, sort of integrating uh, versus versus replacing. I, I think a lot of humans, yeah, I think in studying the, the computer and the advent of the computer, we feared that computers would replace people. And the reality is <clears throat> they did. They also just changed how we work. Right? We ended up doing not a lot more knowledge work, right? Like four to five dollars, you know, four to five people being in the knowledge workspace versus being out in the in the fields. Um, and as we think about this next, the fourth industrial revolution that we're hearing about, uh, that's been uh that's trending at the, you know, at the global level um, as we think about the future. Uh, definitely dirty, dull, dangerous, repetitive. It's all the jobs we're not able to find people for right now, right? It's like, you know, the all these jobs that, you know, that we can't find cleaners for buildings. We can't find uh, workers that are coming into the restaurants to do some of these jobs. Construction has had this problem for years. It's, it was a national crisis. Um, but we're now seeing this fold over into all these other industries. And it seems to be coming back to the nature of work, right? And so how how do we encourage the space uh, for humans to do their best work, right? And also think about where robots come in that can work 24 seven and take over some of those things that no, no, no one really likes, right? But that requires, it still requires, you know, retraining and, and we put this technology out there and yet humans are still, you know, still have to catch up and retrain. And, you know, there's a lot of change management that happens. And so um, how, how we design for that and think about those that get left behind, um, I think is, is a really important, uh, aspect of our, of our future responsibility. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, I use like Microsoft Excel, right? Everybody, I think at the time, I think when Microsoft Excel first came out, oh, it's going to replace so much, uh, so many people that were doing, you know, entry, uh, and, and record keeping, right. But instead, what did it do? It ended up creating a ton of data entry people. You know, they went from physical to the computer, to the PC, right? And the second thing that it created was data analysts. And so I felt, if anything, it created more opportunities. Um, and I think it's the importance for us here, especially in this day and age coming out of the pandemic, is just really understanding how do I, how do I bridge those opportunities? How do, I, how do I be deliberate in planning how to bridge people's transition into that? Um, and I mean, there's just obviously a ton in the ed tech space that has been focused on upskilling, like Workera AI is a fantastic company doing that, um, where it's, it's happening, you know, and the tools are free. They're, they're all openly available content uh, with certifications uh, that you can enroll into. I'm really excited for the additional jobs we create. So I uh, agree with both of you, but I guess let's just play devil's advocate here for a second. We've, we've thrown out some really good examples of thinking certain things were going to replace people and then they kind of enhance things. What about like the truck drivers of the world and, you know, the people that 
that's not something where it's like, okay, now the truck drives itself. The truck drivers now isn't necessarily going to have a job that's directly related to somehow managing the the trucking fleet. When you have, I think I read something recently that said there's 10 million people that are employed that, you know, their main job is to drive, whether that's taxi, Uber, truck drivers, or, or what have you. So I think that's an interesting concept. And what it makes me kind of think about is just like the overarching macroeconomic policies that are going to need to be well thought out to plan for this. Because I love the idea of freeing up the people that are doing the jobs that no one wants to do anyway, and now allowing them to do something that they're more passionate about or paying people more to do the, you know, at home care that we found is so necessary and all the different stay at home moms that don't make any money, but, uh, you know, it's a valuable part of our economy. And so, you know, is that UBI or or what sort of macroeconomic changes do we need to make in order to make the transition to this, you know, more robotic focused uh, environment possible and to allow, you know, ultimately the humans to thrive alongside you know, some of these other technologies that will be replacing certain jobs and skills. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a lot of it is going back to the basics, right, of, of uh, what are some foundational things that we still need to fix, right? So when it comes to technology, the first thing that comes to mind, for me at least, is, is the digital divide. And, uh, and, and that really lays in, in three fields, right? It's having basic access to connectivity at the broadband level, um, two, be able to have a, a device that is fitting uh, the fitting of your uh, daily needs and professional needs, and three, uh, be able to have digital literacy so that you can operate safely and securely online, and, and actually understand the opportunities that are out there, but also the risks. And something that we worked on quite a bit uh, it, it, when I was, you know, chief innovation officer was. Uh, trying to bridge that digital divide. And so we launched several initiatives ranging from building out our own community Wi-Fi programs um, to pushing out mobile Wi-Fi hotspots. But most importantly, like the, I think the coolest thing I'm proud of is uh, partnering with a company called Helium, uh, which is a Web3 company backed by Andreessen Horowitz Coastal Ventures, uh, where we essentially mine Helium tokens, push out their decentralized wireless networks uh, in the lower WAN. Uh, it's a long fi network uh, but eventually will lead to uh, 5G as well, and simultaneously take those revenues generated from mining crypto and pay for low-income household internet plans. And so, Chris, to your point of a, a UBI, like that's a very targeted, it's what I call tech-enabled UBI, where we rethought the government business model of generating revenues for the for uh, through emerging technology for public benefit. Um, and I hope you know more people across different stakeholders in government, corporations, uh, as well as just nonprofits and, and, and self-organizing individuals uh, who take initiative uh, can, can be able to access resources, garner support, uh, and be able to execute on, on um, fixing our foundations because uh, we, we really need to fix our foundations. I think if we think about the, the, the retraining that computers created for our economy and our people it was it's is a massive massive shift right if we think about the last 15 years and what the digital evolution has done it's created a massive massive shift for better or for worse and i think it happened so fast that we were we weren't aware of the of the unintended consequences essentially but now that we've learned um and we're seeing the, the yeah. pros and the cons of connecting and the importance of disconnecting and better understand our our own brain and our emotions. And uh, I think that's the opportunity to, to design for the future. And I, and I think as we think about robots, it's it, I, I believe it'll be, these are just machines that have a, more intelligence, um, you know, some more intelligence, they can be smarter, but machines aren't new to humans. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just that the, but AI, the AI and intelligence, actually things truly being smart Versus just doing logical things and repetitive things automatically, you know that this is a new this is a new wave, and I think it begets the importance of of design, you know, the very things we're talking about, uh, and the very things are hopefully our, our our world leaders are talking about in the in these uh, world economic forums, 
Um, certainly the fourth industrial revolution covers a lot of these topics. So, uh, and if you look at the political messages that are happening around the world, they're echoing some of these same things, you know, like these same messages. And so it's, it's definitely in our minds. I don't know if we have all the solutions yet. Um, but hopefully, you know, these sort of conversations helps us all individually as company owners or individuals, um, as world leaders to, to think about, uh, our, the things that are changing around us and, and how they impact us and how we can prepare, uh, for the future. Um, with that, I want to shift a little bit to some advice from you guys. You both like Chris, you're an ultra marathoner, which is super impressive. Jordan, you have an impressive background sort of around the world and also being in the army reserves and done, you know, all these tours, all of those things require, you know, some mental toughness. Um, and we've, we've kind of been really in this topic of, of mental wellness as we think about the future of work. I'm interested in some of your guys' thoughts, just on a more personal note for our, for our uh, audience. Um, what advice do you have for kind of mental wellness and mental toughness? Chris, start with you. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll start out with a cliche quote and it's what success starts when you step outside your comfort zone or something like that. Um, the other thing that I'll say is it's never something that you fully achieve, right? It's like an ongoing process. And so I think your process and your goals have to be greater than your feelings because if, if you don't have processes in place and you don't have goals, your feelings are going to make up excuses for why you're going to just sit there and keep watching the TV as opposed to going out and doing something that's going to benefit you from a wellness and health standpoint. This kind of links to how could workplace transformation draw employees back into the office if the office accommodates the tasks that I need to do. I can't do all my work at home. And I think we also need to educate people on how we operate as human beings. It is not healthy for you to get up, sit in your sweatpants in your basement office or at your dinner table for six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours to do work in the same position. We need to understand why movement is important. We also need to understand the neuropsychology behind going from one task to the other. We need to have this in-between time. I have in-between time when I do work in the morning. I have two or three calls at my house. I then go for the coffee shop. I have in-between time going to the coffee shop. I get into a new work mode. I think about what work tasks I'm doing. I go to the coffee shop, I do my admin work, I leave the coffee shop to go to the office. I now have in between time again. So I think we need to educate ourselves and also make sure that managers, leaders understand the importance of educating people on how to work because we kind of forgot how to work. We just sit in the same office all day. We might use the same two conference rooms. We go to the same coffee machine because that's the coffee machine we like. And we talk to the same people on our floor all day. That's not the way we were supposed to work. My journey to become an ultra marathoner is kind of unique in that I grew up playing all different sports my entire life and played football in college, but running three or four miles around the neighborhood, man, that felt like an accomplishment for me until about four, three or four years ago. And um, through a variety of different events, I kind of got into the ultra marathoning space and uh, I'd never even done a half marathon before, but I said, hey, what the heck, let's jump in and let's do this 50K and see how it goes. And uh, that was a really interesting experience for me. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about time management with juggling two kids at the time and a full-time job and a wife. And so um, whether it's that or whether it's other things that, that, that you're passionate about, you know, you got to make time for yourself. And what I love about running specifically ultra running or just trail running most of the races i do are trails and that's where most of my training runs come from it is it almost becomes meditative you get to get outside you're interacting with nature the scenery is always changing even if it's the same path because of weather conditions or things of that nature and as opposed to putting in music i put in a podcast or an audio book so i feel like it's kind of a triple whammy for me so to speak it's it's meditative and it's good for my mind it's physical exercise and um and it's also just 
you know, I learned something through listening to these different po- podcasts and, and audio books. Uh, the last thing I'll say is it's much more mental than it is physical. And I love a mental challenge. I start every day with an ice cold shower. And I think if you can get up and do something hard that challenges yourself every day, then you have got off to a pretty good start. Uh, similar to I'm sure Jordan can share like just the act of making your bed, right? Like, that's probably something that's been instilled in him from his time in the reserves and in the army. And, and there's, there's uh, studies and there's things that have shown that if you start out your day with one small win or one thing that's hard, the rest of your day kind of falls into place. And so it's been a fun journey. I have a marathon that I'm signed up for in a few weeks here, and then I'm uh, planning on doing at least a 50 uh, mile race before the end of the year. So it should be, should be a lot of fun. Jordan. Your thoughts on mental yeah, wellness, you know, mental toughness. <laughs> you know, I, I think my approach to uh, to fitness, at least, a lot of it is on um, it's it's in part maintenance, uh, and in part it's being able to be. And why I say maintenance is because you know what I'm trying to do is just get, make sure that if I'm ever called up again for whatever reason possible, you know, for whatever conflict, that I can go out. I can deliver, I can lead. And most importantly, uh, my body, despite the stresses, uh, allows me to still have the mental acuity and emotional stability to make decisions that have impact on other people's lives. You know, both the soldiers you lead, uh, but also the civilians on the battlefield uh, to your enemy uh, and and other uh, non-combatants that might be uh, uh, floating around. And so, um, that's my approach, you know, in terms of my overall philosophy for things. Um, and look, you know, when it comes to managing stress, especially, you know, the pandemic, you know, I, I've had the opportunity as a diplomat back in the day to, to have gone through, you know, survival training and, um, uh, having very interesting water, uh, experience with water. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> And uh, I think the one thing it taught me was knowing when to get out of your head um, and when to also just give yourself some space and distance internally uh, from when the situation is beyond your control. And usually that's when trauma happens, right? Is when you have absolutely no control over the situation and over how the events are going to unfold and you're on it for the ride and it's not, and you know, it's not the direction you want to be in. Um, that is a terrible t- place to be. And that's where a lot of post-traumatic stress happens, um, you know, combat or non-combat related, right, in, in, in people's lives. And so it's really important for you to be able to step out of that, uh, not dwell on it, some things, uh, to be progressive in fixing and addressing those things, uh, but at the same time to be kinder to yourself too afterwards. And um, if you're not kind to yourself, I, I hate to say it, the world's not going to be kind to you. Um, and so, you know, that, that needs to happen first in order to condition it and then signal to the world, Hey, be kind to me as well. But if the expectation is not inherently fulfilled internally, it's hard to, to, you know, have the world deliver on that contract as well. Thanks for these insights. The, the, they're deep, uh, they're actually related, you know, to kind of how we connect and disconnect. And, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of what we learned these last couple of years, I think, uh, hopefully shape our role in shaping the future and thinking about, um, the buildings we work in, uh, the, the, the exercise that we do or the routines that we have that give us the, the fortitude, um, and give us the peace of mind. So thanks again for being here, Jordan. Uh, loved having you. Chris loved having you. And uh, it was a, it was a fun conversation. I think we, we learned a lot together. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Chris, it's great to meet you. Likewise, Jordan and Jeff. Appreciate you putting this together. Fun conversation, guys. The Future of Podcast is brought to you by Fresh Consulting. To find out more about how we pair design and technology together to shape the future, visit us at freshconsulting.com. Make sure to search for the future of an Apple podcast, Spotify, Google podcast, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any of our future episodes. And on behalf of our team here at Fresh, thank you for listening.